All right, welcome to this edition of Alder Talk. Uh, this is something we created right when the COVID shutdown started. And uh, it was in response to questions I was getting from people that I've known over the years in the legal business. And instead of answering, you know, questions 50 times, I said, let's just do it all at one time and started as a Zoom and uh, grew kind of exponentially over the pandemic. So this is a new year, a new Alder Talk, and welcome. So in this edition of Alder Talk, I want to talk about depositions. You know, I teach this class at Loyola Law School. I have taken, I don't even know, thousands of depositions. I've read thousands of depositions. I have a database of literally seven, 8,000 expert depositions. And over the years, I have uh, learned some techniques, perfected techniques, learn from other people, and I teach them on how to control a deposition. Now, I want to start by talking about why depositions are so important. So in only about one or two percent of your cases, uh, do you try the case? So the deposition, the use of a deposition at trial only happens one or two percent of the times that you take a deposition. So why are you taking depositions? Why are you worried about getting every nook and cranny covered in a deposition when 98 percent of the time it's not going to be used? Right? And if you forget something in a deposition and you do go to trial, you could probably ask it then. It's not a huge deal. But depositions are the single most important skill when you litigate. Because not only do you get information, and how you approach the deposition allows you to get good cross-examination, but many times this is the first face-to-face -face or in-camera remote contact with the defense lawyer. Most of the time, it's of some, someone important in the case, the plaintiff, the defendant. This is your time to not only meet opposing counsel, but to size them up, but to show them what kind of lawyer you are, to show them that you have thought about this case by being prepared with exhibits, uh, certain things that you might create. So depositions are critical because it's the first impression many times that you have with defense. And remember, after that important depo, plaintiff or defendant usually, or PMK, the defense lawyer is writing a letter update letter to the carrier. And if you make a good impression, and I'm going to tell you how to use some of the techniques to do that. When they talk about the quality of the plaintiff's case, they might not say, well, you know, the plaintiff's lawyer is a badass. I'm scared of them, et cetera, et cetera. They're really good. We need a lot of money. But no, instead, they will think that and say, you know, the plaintiff makes a great impression. This is a really good a case for the plaintiff. We're going to have a hard time X, Y, Z. And that's primarily because of the way you present at the deposition. So let's talk about some basic things in a deposition that you have to deal with. You have to look a certain way. So one, if it's a live deposition, clean up your conference room. Take the boxes out, clean it up, Make sure that the people walking in the door to the conference room don't see crap everywhere. Right? If it's a remote deposition, pay attention to what's behind you. Right? Um, I don't use fake backgrounds, but I make sure that you know there's not garbage in the corner, that things are not disheveled. That makes a first impression. Second, what you wear is important. I am not suggesting that you should wear a suit and tie, but it's certainly there's no downside to that other than perhaps your comfort. But at a minimum, you want to be presentable and you want to have a presentable conference room. If it is in person, the quality of your coffee, the type of creamer makes a difference. I swear, I used to have half and half at all of my in-person depots. And I believe that Certainly some of those cases have settled for significantly more money 
because the defense lawyer goes to get coffee, says, hey, Mike, where's the creamer? And I'm like, right there in the in the, the carafe. And they're like, wait, is that half and half? I'm like, yeah, we're big time, baby. Again, that may sound silly, but these things add up and make a difference. Also, you always want to videotape your depositions. It gives solemnity, importance to the depo, but it also keeps a defense lawyer in check when you start using the techniques of how to control a deposition. So first off, any deposition needs to be well prepared. The appearance needs to be nice. You have to have um, your ducks in a row. Your coffee is good. The creamer is there. It's videotaped. Now, most people start a deposition with an admonition. I believe that is a total waste of an opportunity and a waste of time. And I say that because admonitions are done for one purpose, at least usually. It's to prevent them at trial from saying, well, I didn't understand the process. You didn't explain it to me. And I, that's not what I meant. I have in 30 years, 100 plus jury trials, never heard that ever at a trial, ever. Right? So we do these admonitions at the beginning as some sort of shield when you don't realize that that admonition can be used later as a sword. And I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But imagine that you're asking questions and a defendant says, like what I wait for, I don't remember that. And I know they remember something. I don't know. I can't estimate. And I know they can estimate. I do not give the admonition at the beginning of the depot when I wait for a time when something like that is happening. And I say, you know what? Let me just take a step back here. I just asked you a question and you said you can't remember. But I think that you certainly could remember something about that. You said you don't know, but I think you may know some things. And I want to talk about the process. This is a deposition in a legal proceeding. That's why you gave an oath to tell the truth under the penalty of perjury. Right? It's different than if we're at a party and somebody says, hey, how you doing? How was that party? Whatever. If you don't want to answer, you can say, eh, I don't know, or eh, it was good, and just leave it at that, right? Because in a social setting, you're not obligated to convey all of the information that you know. Because this is under the penalty of perjury in a legal proceeding, you don't get to say, I don't know and I don't remember if there is something that you remember, right? If there's something that you know. If you want to couch it in, well, I'm not 100% sure, but I think, but we are entitled to every shred of information that is in your brain. Even if you have to guesstimate, estimate, we are entitled to that because it's under the penalty of perjury. You understand that? Yes. And also, I want to say that I'm going to ask you some uncomfortable questions. Things that you're going to want to say, I don't know, I don't remember, that you're not going to want to answer. But because you're under the penalty of perjury in a legal proceeding, you have to answer the question if you can. Do you understand that? Now, the reason I do that is because oftentimes when you use the techniques later in the depot, when you go for the jugular, and I've done this a bunch of times, and you ask those uncomfortable questions, you are at fault. You falsified the records. That really happened. You really said those things. That's not really true, is it? Those types of questions, after you have gotten some control, their first instinct many times is to still say, you are at fault. Well, I don't know. Now, then you can go back to, now, see, this is something that I think you know. I mean, you were one of two people in the, in the incident, and you say you don't know if you're at fault, but clearly you have some idea if you were at fault. And remember, this is a legal proceeding under the penalty of perjury. You were at fault, weren't you? Well, if it has to be under the penalty of perjury, yeah, maybe some. Right? I've, I remember very distinctly an elder abuse case where I had a nurse that she wouldn't answer the questions and I used that admonition and she started, and then I used my techniques and she started to talk. And ultimately, I said to the nurse, you see all these doctor entries, 
those were made after the fact, right? They were falsified. Oh, I don't know about that. I said, you remember, this is one of those times, that really uncomfortable question, where you do, under the penalty of perjury, have to answer and think about what you really know. And, you know, you really know this is falsified information, right? And sure enough, she goes, well, if I have to answer under the penalty of perjury, yes, it was. It's a very effective sword that we used to use as a shield. But now let's jump and talk about some techniques. Depositions are about pushing to get answers. And there's two different philosophies. There is get information. And that's a philosophy where you see predominantly young lawyers coming in with a tome of written questions with blanks that they fill in. Or cross-examination. I go cross-examination all the time. Remember, if I don't get all the information, 98% of the time, it's irrelevant because it never goes to trial anyway. So what are some of the techniques to control? Well, remember that under the law, the other side can only make form of the question objections at a deposition. That means the only objections they should be making that if they don't make, they waive at trial or form of the question objections, vague, compound, lacks foundation, right? calls for speculation. And the reason they have to make it or they waive, and what I mean by waive, they can't make it at trial if they haven't raised it in a deposition, is because that gives the questioning attorney an opportunity to contemplate, well, is that really vague? Is it really compound? Is it unclear? and then ask another question that's clearer. But you have to raise it to give the lawyer an opportunity. But once that objection is done, that form of the question, the only other objections that need to be made is privacy and privilege. Relevance is not a proper objection in a deposition. And so the first important thing to understand is that the only objections you should be hearing our objection, vague, objection, lacks foundation, objection, compound, period. They don't get to then say, do you mean X? Uh, it, you know, misstates the testimony, what the witness has already said, you cut that off. Right? But secondly, when there's a privacy or a privilege, that is the only way that a defense lawyer can instruct their witness not to answer. And the case is called Stewart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, versus Colonial Western. By the way, learn how to spell cases. Right? When you're talking in a deposition and you say, well, you can't instruct them not to answer under Stewart versus Colonial Western. That's S-T-E-W-A-R-T. Defense lawyers freak out. Judges freak out. People think that you're brilliant. And I realize that that sounds ridiculous. But spelling cases is really important. What does Stewart versus Colonial Western, that's S-T-E-W-A-R-T, stand for? Is that the only objections that can be made where you can instruct a witness not to answer or where it calls for privacy or privilege. How many times have we been in depo? I'm not going to let them answer unless you tell me how it's relevant. Not a proper objection. Right? Uh, calls for legal conclusion. Don't answer the question. Not a proper objection. Right? And being able to get an answer, even if the answer is, I don't know, right, is important. And you use Stewart versus Colonial Western as the weapon. Right? Secondly, controlling the room is really important. The Emerson Electric Company case, and these sites should will be in the, in the, the bio and in the comments, says that in a deposition, you can ask the deponent to act out, to write on the board, to write a schematic, to do something to show, well, so-and-so punched me. How did they punch you? Show me. You know, where did, how did your body move? Show me. Go up on the board and write the intersection and show me where your um, car was. And so I realized that controlling someone 
is easier when I can make them do something. So I oftentimes bring a whiteboard into my deposition, certainly when it was in person. Again, remote, it's much, 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 much more difficult. And under the Emerson Electric Company, that's E-M-E-R-S-O-N, when I would have the defendant describe the impact or where it happened, I would maybe write an intersection up on the whiteboard and I would say, come get up. Here's the marker. Go right on the board where your car was. Objection. Uh, You know, I'm not going to let him do that. Don't do that. Well, under Emerson Electric Company, E-M-E-R-S-O-N, we absolutely can do that. And imagine the control of the defense lawyer sitting over there and you and the witness are up at the whiteboard and I have taken hour long depots, hours and hours where me and the deponent are standing by the whiteboard talking with the defense lawyer over there objecting. It's a very powerful, very powerful way to control things. You can stand up in a depot at any time. You can take your deposition standing up. I'm not suggesting that you intimidate people But standing up is a power move. It is exerting control. So in sum, look good. Have a presentable office. Have good coffee, good creamer, videotape. Understand that form of the question objections are the only ones that can be made that if they don't make them are waived. Privacy and privilege are the only grounds to instruct a witness not to answer a question under Stewart versus Colonial Western. Bring a whiteboard. Have the person stand up and write on the whiteboard as you can under the Emerson Electric Company case. Use the admonition not at the beginning as a shield, but later as a sword.